What's on your radar, Colin? Over the last few weeks, we've heard lots of talk about Biden's agenda in the media. Maybe some of it, as we should. He's a new president in his first year of office. And some think he's got an aggressive agenda to potentially help real folks. Things like free and low-cost community college, an increased child tax credit, and universal pre-K. However, what's not really being talked about is actually more important. That's how these things are going to get paid for. Now stick with me for a moment. I'm not talking about the typical talking point nonsense we hear from most talking heads in opposition to him, about how is he gonna pay for all this? I'm actually talking about how it's paid for. And interestingly enough, why both parties are part of the problem here. Okay, congressional budget rules state that any permanent increase in the deficit must be paid for by an offset. The Biden plan does that in a pretty straightforward way, by taxing the rich. It's not important how for this segment, it's only important that we know that's how it gets done. Now there are multiple polls that show this is fairly popular with voters, and most economists think it would have a minuscule effect, if any, on the economy as it almost assuredly rebounds. So what's the real deal here? Well, of course, Lobbyists working their magic with members of Congress to water down any tax increases on capital gains is surely going on, but we already knew that. We know that's a huge part of the problem with the system. However, what's important here to examine is a slightly different take on that, and something that's important to fully understand the extent of. I work in campaigns, and I can tell you firsthand, they're very, very expensive. A typical political consultant might sit down with a potential candidate and ask them, can you call your closest circle of friends and raise at least 100 grand in a month? If yes, they'll say they're viable. If not, they'll say, ah, let's look for another candidate. Why? Well, in 2018, the average winning Senate campaign spent $15.7 million. And the average winning House candidate spent over $2 million. Second, and maybe now not so surprisingly, these campaigns are actually paid for by rich people. In fact, a very small group of rich people. Here's the data on that. One half of all congressional campaign donations in 2016 came from just 16,000 people. That's right. Of all the people that voted, 50% of the funds for campaigns came from just 16,000 individuals. So as both parties look at 2022 and attempt to win or maintain control of one or both houses of Congress, why would they agree to increase taxes on the same 16,000 wealthy people they have to turn around and raise all their campaign money from? The answer is, it's really not likely that they will. And that goes for both Democrats and Republicans. So is there a fix for this problem so that campaigns can get their message out without being beholden to such a small group of individuals who then have the power to inhibit policy proposals that would help most, like the ones I mentioned before? Maybe. New York City, which has elections ongoing right now, designed a program specifically to address this and put more economic power into the hands of more people in elections. It's called public finance. Here's how it works. Under the New York City public finance program, a $10 donation from a New York City resident can be worth as much as $90 under their nine to one match program. Not a bad idea. More small, more small dollar donations funding campaigns, specifically from the people in the area that a potential politician will be representing. So why not apply that federally? I say let's stop candidates from raising most of their money from a very small group of very affluent people and instead use public finance to put the power back into people's hands so that when a policy is both popular, like increasing taxes on the wealthy is, to fund programs that are also very popular, like free low-cost community college, student loan forgiveness, we're not dependent on the same 16,000 wealthy donors to approve it before it gets done. That, that's a fascinating radar, and the numbers are really stark, Colin. Very much so. Yeah, there's very a lot going on there. And what's, you know makes me think even, what makes the situation more dire, in, in my opinion, is that when these people get to Congress um, after raising all of this money, and even if they have lower net worths, as some of them do, they're suddenly surrounded, and they have the lobbyists whispering in their ear, um, and there's all of that good stuff going on, that real people actually still can continue to fall to the 
fall all the way, tumble down the priority list um, because who's chirping in your ear when you're in Congress is not the people. It doesn't matter how much time you spend in the district. You're hearing more from lobbyists. You're hearing more from people in the media and people in the beltway, um, it, even if you try, even yeah. if you try. And those are those are powerful interests. And it's again, this is, I think, something that speaks to the way the system itself is set up. Mm -hmm. I agree. And and one of, the, one of the things that I really like about the New York public finance system is that the match applies to people within the area that those politicians are actually representing, right? right? So if you take a look at 50% of all the funds coming to all congressional campaigns being from 16,000 people, that's clearly not people in their district. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's bad to raise money from outside of your district necessarily if you if you're, you know, have like-minded individuals you're you're working with or working on behalf of on issues, but to think that all of your money, majority of your money is going to come from people who don't actually live in your area is it means that you're going to be beholden to the people whispering in your ear when you get here. Right. Not those who are whispering in your ear when you wanted to run and when you actually maybe wanted to change a part of the system. And that's where we start to get this disconnect. And, and it starts with the money, right? Like people always say to follow the money and it's true. And look, I work in this system. I benefit from this system. I know how, how expensive campaigns are. I write budgets for some of them on the media side. And they're really expensive. Media is really expensive and that's how you communicate with people. But like there's got to be a better way to enable us regular people to engage in this system so that we've got some or equal power with those same 16,000 individuals who are funding all these things. You know, it's an interesting question. There was a, a line in your radar where you said we have to find a way to put power back into people's hands. And what's so strange about thinking of it in those terms, and I think that's a good way to say it, but what's strange about that is public finance actually, it, it arguably, involves government sort of taking power out of people's hands. It's, it's sort of a glass half full, glass half empty, like what do you see in this optical illusion type situation? Sure. Um, it's, it's true that the effect of public financing would probably be to undercut the ultra wealthy, but at the same time, it would involve regulation that would take um, some freedoms away from average people. And so it, it's, a, it's sort of like one of those really difficult questions where at the end of the day, do I think you know, the principle of allowing people to you know, have the power to give what they want to those campaigns stands up? I do, but the way that it's actually executed in this country has meant a concentration of power among the rich as they continue to use that power and that concentration of power to get richer by rigging the system. Because even when they get their people elected, even when they don't get their people elected, I mean, Hillary Clinton had way more money than Donald Trump in 2016, and she lost. Um, and, and that's very different on the local level, and I'm sure you can speak to that. Sure, money sure. matters a whole lot more in some of those you know, run-of-the-mill congressional races than it does in a presidential race where if you're Donald Trump, you can just go on Morning Joe every day and you know get free earned media. Sure. But it's it's a, a really sort of it's a it's an interesting question when you're sort of balancing all of the variables of freedom and uh, like actual principle and what to speech, what is money and what is speech. Yeah. And there are a lot yeah. of important questions. But you, one point that you raise, I think, is so important is the local aspect of all of yeah. this. And I, and I think we've got to put you know, we've got to find a way to put that power back in people's hands. And I understand that some people who have more money are going to want to donate and they're always going to be able to donate to more campaigns. And that's that's you know, that's fine. That's to be expected. Start a pack. Yeah. Well, yeah, well <laughs> We've got too many already, you oh, know. Yeah. I mean, look, I work for them too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to be perfectly honest, but but the, you know, the reality of those of those things, yeah, exactly. They they can start a pack, but you know what? What a lot of leaders who have come to me and say, "Hey, man, I'm really thinking about running for office, right?" Men, women, and and they don't have an incredible net worth. Yes. They don't have familial wealth, and they have to look at running for a federal office. And they would, by all by all kind of ways to examine their career, but be have the potential to be great leaders. Yep. For us. They have to say, can I actually afford to go and raise money and campaign as a full-time job? And that's really difficult. Right. But a matching system that doesn't take away power from people who want to donate around the country as much as they want, right. but enables these folks who don't have this great wealth to actually run for office because they've got a matching system and they can raise $10 from their friends and get 100 out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really kind of starts to rebalance that. And I think we've gotten to a point where I don't, I'm not sure anybody looks at the system and say it's not completely unbalanced. I would just, we just talked about the data. Oh, yeah, and the no. data says it is. Yeah, no, th yeah. It's, it's, this is one of the parts of the system that gives the ultra-wealthy outsized influence over our politics. There's just no question about it. And I'm, I'm not opposed to uh, something like the matching system at all, as long as it's uniform 
reform, um, I think it makes I, I think it makes a good deal of sense. I still think there are sort of like basic questions of of principle to sort of factor in, and I don't think you would disagree with that. Um, I, but I, I mean, I'm not opposed to it. I do think that it's a it's probably time for more innovation in terms of how we regulate campaign finance because just transparency alone. Which we have, we have. Uh, a good deal of. We have. It, it's not the sunlight hasn't been the disinfectant it um, has not. in this case. No. And again, we continue to see these barriers of entry to public office for people who aren't going to stick around there for 20 years and just sort of treat the swamp like a hot tub. Um, the barrier, the barrier to entry. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not an original uh, <laughs> line from me, uh, but I think it's Stan Evans. But the barrier to entry there is uh, way too high, and campaign finance is a huge, huge part of that. If you don't come with all of this, these contacts and people in your net, you just you described an anecdote that is completely common in this business, which is that somebody says they want to run for office. Consultants come in and say, I need you to you know, make calls, raise $100,000 in a month. If you can't do it, they're not going to help. Yeah. They're not going to help. You can run sort of these one, one of these like small little campaigns. Grassroots campaigns. Grassroots which campaigns. Which normally means you lose, sadly enough, because you can't communicate. Right. We have seen success of some like really grassroots campaigns campaigns um, recently that haven't had a ton of funding. It is possible. It's it, it, there. It is. But they're the, the right. outliers. They're the outliers. They're the outliers. And yeah. that's part of the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to your radar next.